sisters in Christ, what are the signs, the events in human history that the Bible foretells must precede the end of the world and the second coming of Jesus Christ? The first of these signs is the return of the Jews to Palestine. You recall during the lifetime of our Lord when some of his disciples were admiring the beautiful temple that had been built by King Herod. Our Lord said the day was coming when not a stone would be left upon a stone. That all of Jerusalem and the great temple would be destroyed. This prophecy of our divine Savior was fulfilled within about 40 years, in the year 70 A.D. The Roman legions under General Titus descended upon Palestine. They put the whole population to the sword. They destroyed the city. They literally tore it apart. And all the Jews were driven out. Many were taken as slaves to Rome. It was Jewish slave labor that built the Colosseum in the city of Rome. And the Jews at this time were dispersed to the four corners of the world. Yet when our Lord is describing the end of the world, the Jews are definitely back in the Holy Land. And this was in fulfillment to a prophecy made by the great prophet Moses. 3,000 years ago in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses predicted that the Jewish nation would be dispersed throughout the world. But then he went on to say, and I'm quoting here the 30th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. He said, the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion upon you. And he will gather you again from all the people where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will fetch you. We are seeing the fulfillment of this prophecy today before our very eyes. It began in 1947, the British mandate uh, had ceased at this time. This was after World War II and the Zionist movement. The Jewish people once again began to stream back to the Holy Land. You'll notice this was exactly 30 years after Fatima. The second sign predicted in the New Testament by our Divine Savior was that the Jewish people would regain control of the city of Jerusalem. Again you recall his prophecy that not a stone would be left upon a stone. The people would be scattered throughout the world. But our Lord also said, When you see Jerusalem surrounded by an army, then know that her desolation is at hand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are in her midst go out. For these are days of vengeance, that all things that are written may be fulfilled. For there will be great distress over the land and wrath upon this people, and they will fall by the edge of the sword, and they will be led away as captives to all the nations. And Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. So our Lord said, 
Jerusalem would be under the control of Gentile nations, but only for a definite period of time. Only during that definite period of time that God would grant to the Gentiles to enter the kingdom of God. And then when that time was over, the Jews would regain control of the holy city of Jerusalem. Well, this took place in June of 1967. The war in the Middle East of 1967. The Jewish armies recaptured the holy city of Jerusalem. And to me, this is a very significant date, June 1967, exactly 50 years after Fatima. On the 50th anniversary of Our Lady's message at Fatima, the time of the Gentiles had ended. This date is particularly significant to me. Do you recall that it was in 67 that all our troubles began? When so many priests began defecting from their ministry, so many nuns began to leave their apostolates. And even before I became familiar with this prophecy, I began to wonder. And I said to myself, I wonder if God gave us 50 years to heed the message of Adam. He gave us 50 years to answer our Blessed Mother's pleas. And when we failed to do that, and we did, Catholics have failed to respond to the message of Fatima. Oh yes, a small faithful remnant have adhered to Our Lady, but most Catholics have ignored the message of Fatima. This was a great insult to God. A great insult that we should ignore his mother, whom he personally sent to us to warn us of these terrible times. And so the times of the Gentiles grew to an end. The second sign preceding the coming of Jesus Christ would be a great apostasy. This was predicted by St. Paul in his second letter to the Thessalonians. You know, some of the Thessalonians at this time were expecting our Lord's coming immediately. And as a result, they weren't working anymore. They were selling their farms and no doubt being swindled out of them. And they were expecting that at any moment Christ would return and the world would end. You recall this happened a few years ago in America, where a group of people were convinced that the second coming was imminent. They sold their farms, and God knows who got the money. And they went up on top of a mountain and awaited the second coming of Christ. Well, this hysteria was taking place in Thessalonica. And so our... St. Paul wrote to them, telling them not to be deceived. He said, We beseech you by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and our being gathered together unto him. Let no one deceive you in any way, for the day of the Lord will not come unless the apostasy comes first. Apostasy comes from a Greek word meaning rebellion or revolt against God. You recall one of the early Christian emperors after the conversion of the Roman Empire and most of the emperors following Constantine were Christians. One of them was Julian, born and raised a Christian, but he rebelled. And he tried to reinstitute the religion of old pagan Rome. He's known in history as Julian the Apostate. Julian the one who revolted against Jesus Christ. 
Today we see the most organized and systematic revolt against Jesus Christ that the world has ever known. Marxism, euphemistically called communism, which it is not, the real error here is Marxism. Marxist atheism is a militant atheism on a worldwide scale. We think of Karl Marx, the founder of the Communist Manifesto, as wanting to do away with private property and with family life. Those were only two things Marx said must be destroyed. The first thing that, vowed, that Marx vowed to destroy was religion. He said religion was the opium of the people. He said religion is responsible for keeping the workers down. If we are to have true freedom and economic prosperity, we must destroy religion. And the Soviet movement in the, day to de uh, in the world today is dedicated unreservedly to the destruction of religion on a worldwide scale. You know, these communists are known for their deception and their lies. But one thing that they have never tried to hide is their intention to conquer the entire world. As recently as 1973, Leonid Brezhnev, the present their leader of the Soviet Union, said before a gathering of the Communist Congress that total dominion over the whole world the complete communization of the entire world is still the goal, despite detente, despite, despite pe peaceful coexistence. They intend to conquer the whole world. And we see this going on in Africa, in Central America, in Asia. One nation after another is falling under communist enslavement. And they begin the immediate eradication of religion. Not too long ago, I read a book by Sergei Kurdikov called The Persecutor. If you really want to know what life is like in the Soviet Union today, read that book. The title is The Persecutor by Sergei Kurdikov. Young Russian, born and raised under Marxism. A dedicated communist. He had a brilliant future in the communist youth movement. He was a cadet at the Soviet Naval Academy. Finally, he escaped. He defected. He jumped ship off the coast of Canada. Swam for five hours in ice cold water simply to get out of the hell of the Soviet Union. He wrote about his life there. And how he had been recruited as a communist youth leader. He had been re recruited by the KGB the dreaded Soviet secret police. He had been recruited to completely exterminate Christianity. That's how he made his spending money as a young cadet. They were equipped with special clubs made of solid steel covered with hard rubber. Informers would tell them where the Christians were meeting secretly in barns and in log cabins out in the forest. And they would burst in on their meetings and they would beat everyone to a pulp. And he said this vicious and cruel persecution of Christians was under the direct orders of Leonid Brezhnev. That the very moment that he was being wined and dined in our nation's capital, sipping cocktails with the leaders of our nation, he had ordered this vicious extermination of religion throughout the Soviet Union. This same atheism under different guises, is spreading like a cancer throughout the Western world. And again, it's not merely the denial of God, it's an anti-theism, a desire to eradicate God. The leading philosophers today in our state universities, Hegel, the father of dialectical materialism, the father, grandfather, you might say, of communism, Feuerbach, Kant, Nietzsche. Nietzsche, the brainchild of Nazism, existentialism, Camus, and Sartre. The leading names in our universities today in philosophy 
all committed atheists vowed to the destruction of God and religion throughout the world. In our own country, that death of God movement that made so many headlines back in the 1960s. And those people were dead serious. By the death of God, that's exactly what they were going to do, is kill God and they were going to bury him. They were going to completely destroy and remove religion from the American way of life. And they've succeeded. God is an outlaw in American public schools. God is outlaw in American public education. Our schools can teach about Karl Marx, teach about Hitler, but they cannot teach about Jesus Christ. They cannot teach about God. So that our children today in our public schools are getting exactly the same education as the children of the Soviet Union. An education in which God is completely ignored. And they found that that's the most effective way to spread atheism. In the beginning, they attacked God. Joseph Stalin used to go around the communist youth rallies attacking God, telling the communist youth not to think about God. Well, can you, you know of a better way to arouse curiosity? No, they found that the most effective way to spread communism, atheism, is to ignore God. Make him totally unimportant, completely remove him from education, culture, and life. This is exactly what has been accomplished in America today. In our public schools, over television, just as you know, watch television and you're getting a picture of a perfect atheistic culture. Our federal government has adopted the atheistic philosophy of life. When our Supreme Court, you know tomorrow is Respect Life Sunday in the Archdiocese of Chicago. When our government, uh, when our Supreme Court enacted the death penalty for millions of unborn babies, they were following a perfect atheistic logic. In an atheistic country, are you and I created equal? Are you and I, as our Declaration of Independence said, endowed by our Creator with rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which no Supreme Court can take away? No. With one stroke of the pen, our Supreme Court took away the right to life to untold millions of unborn babies. For 200 years, the American people had upheld the right to life of these children in the womb of their mothers. With a stroke of the pen, our Supreme Court, following a perfect atheistic logic, because to the atheist, you and I are just evolved monkeys. We're just chimpanzees who somehow lost our hair and began walking on our hind legs. We're the hairless apes. We're just cattle to them. As we know from time to time, farmers have to slaughter part of their herd. When the price of feed goes up, they say, well, we can't afford to feed these calves. We've got to kill them in order to stay in business. Well, this is the way our government looks at us today. We're just, we're just evolved monkeys. We're just animals and cattle. If it becomes too inconvenient, too expensive to, to care for them, why not exterminate them? We see this apostasy, this rebellion, going on within the Catholic Church itself. Since 1957, the last 22 years, 40,000 nuns have abandoned their apostles. 11,000 priests have defected from the priesthood. And this is just in the United States. These are not world figures. Two bishops have defected. And 10 million of the laity have abandoned the mystical body of Christ. 
Today we see the apostasy of subversive theologians. If the Gallup poll can be believed, most Catholics in America today reject the Church's teaching. According to a Gallup poll, most Catholics reject the Church's teaching on premarital sex, on the use of contraception, that's 80%, premarital sex, 75%. Three out of four Catholics have revolted against the Church's teaching on premarital sex. Four out of five have revolted against the teaching on contraception. 70% reject the Church's teaching on abortion. Seven Catholics out of ten favor abortion. Divorce and remarriage, 73% reject the Church's teaching. We have priests, theologians, those quotes, going on lecture tours around the United States, professors at Catholic University, writing books and lecturing and advocating a rejection of the Church's teaching on divorce and remarriage. Most priests reject the Church's teaching on the indissolubility of marriage and contraception, 60%. If the poll commissioned by the bishops themselves under the auspices of Andrew Greeley, if this poll can be trusted, 60%, three priests out of every five reject, have revolted against the Church's teaching on the indissolubility of marriage and contraception. This is... Well, as our Lord predicted, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? No, our Lord said there would be a tremendous loss of faith. The fourth sign that would precede and warn us of the second coming of Jesus Christ, the end of the world, would be worldwide corruption and immorality. As our Lord said in the 18th chapter of Luke, because evil will abound, most men's love will grow cold. Evil will abound, our Lord said. Back in 1956, the then Holy Father, Pope Pius XII, said that there was more sin in the world at that time than at any other time in all of human history, more than the pagan empires of Rome and Greece and Persia. He said in the 1950s there was more sin in the world than at any time in all of human history. What would he say today? When you and I look back at the 50s as a golden age of decency in America, compared to the filth and immorality that is running like a torrent throughout our society. Pick up any newspaper, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Murder, robbery, theft, mugging, dope addiction. Just recently on television, they were interviewing high school students at a small town, a suburb of Philadelphia, but it's in New Jersey. According to this report, 60% of those high school students were already hooked on marijuana. Abortion in America today. You know, Adolf Hitler practiced abortion on the Jews, his way of exterminating the Jewish race. You remember we used to wonder, how in God's name could the German people stand by in silence and allow this holocaust to go on in their midst? Well, now we know. Look at America. It's looking the other way. It's ignoring this holocaust. And already more babies have been killed in gas ovens in America than Jews were killed in all of the Nazi terror in Europe. Child abuse, an epidemic in America. Vandalism, 
runs into the billions of dollars every year just of public school property. Rape is an epidemic in Chicago. One woman every half hour is raped in Chicago. This past week I flicked on the evening news. They reported a woman dragged by her hair 15 blocks right through Chicago, held captive for 12 hours, repeatedly abused and raped, child pornography and prostitution, homosexuality, not only uh, encouraged but gloried in in America, venereal disease. An epidemic in the United States. Only people with a cold outnumber those who have contracted venereal disease. Political graft and malfeasance, terrorism throughout the world, guerrilla warfare, drug peddling. Do you know the third largest industry in America today is dope peddling? Only General Motors and Exxon take in more money than the dope business in America. Only General Motors and selling cars and Exxon and selling gasoline grosses more money than the dope industry in the United States. Divorce and the breakup of the home, or just look at movies. The immorality that is not only portrayed, but glorified together with violence, night after night, right in our own homes. The fifth sign that would precede the end of the world is a worldwide persecution of the church. As Christ said, you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. You will be dragged before kings and judges and magistrates day is coming when people will think they are doing a service to God when they put you to death. The church today is undergoing the worst persecution in all its history. In the last 50 years, more Catholics have been martyred than in the first 300 years of church history. You know, that first 300 years, the great Roman persecutions, when all the Roman legions and the whole Roman Empire rose up to crush out Christianity. It's known in history as the Age of Martyrs. And yet in the last 50 years, more Christians have been martyred for their faith than in the first 300 years of church history. Recently, the London Daily, uh, Daily Telegraph commissioned one of their staff writers, Philip van der Reltz, just to tally the number of people that have been killed by the communists, and this only from official documents and world records. The grand total of people put to death by the communists is 142 million. 917,700 people killed since 1917 by the communists. Of these, 80 million were Catholic, Orthodox, and other Christians. And this is just the documented toll. God only knows how many millions have died in Subiaca and other KGB secret prisons or in the death camps of Siberia. The author concluded, after tallying all these totals, that communism is the most efficient and ruthless death machine, those are his words, death machine, that has ever been devised by the mind of man. Today, 71 million Catholics remain behind the Iron Curtain. The Church of Silence, persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ. In World War II, 60 million Christians were killed by the Nazis. Perhaps recently you saw the rerun of the Holocaust, showing how almost 6 million Jews were exterminated by the Nazis. 
In addition to that, 6 million, 60 million Christians were also put to death. 10 to 1. Well, this is what Our Lady came at Fatima to warn us about. She said, if my request for the rosary, for penance and sacrifice, if my requests are not granted, Russia will spread her errors throughout the world, provoking wars and persecutions of the church, she said. The hope the good would be martyred. The Holy Father will have much to suffer. And whole nations will be destroyed. If that's not a description of the end of the world, then I don't know what is. No, it seems to me that these signs are being fulfilled today before our very eyes. There's only one last sign remaining. The final sign preceding the end of the world and the second coming of Jesus Christ will be the appearance of the Antichrist, of which the Bible speaks in many, many places. His coming was prophesied especially by St. Paul, again in his second letter to the Thessalonians. I've already read the opening part of this prophecy. Now concerning the coming of our Lord, Jesus Christ, and our assembling to meet him. That day will not come until the apostasy comes first. And the man of sin is revealed. And notice the title that Paul gives to the Antichrist is the man of sin. The son of hell, he says, the son of hell who will exalt himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you this? And you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his own time. For the hidden power of lawlessness is already at work, but he who now restrains it can do so only until he is removed, and then the lawless one will be revealed. The coming of the lawless one will be by the working of Satan himself, with all pretended signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception of those who are to perish, because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. Therefore God will send upon them a strong delusion to make them believe what is false, so that they may be condemned who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in sinful living. Well, this is a very famous passage from St. Paul's Epistles. And now I will give you the interpretation of the Fathers of the Church. You know, this is a collective title given to early ecclesiastical writers, those who lived within the first four and five hundred years of church history. Men like St. Jerome, St. Augustine, St. Clement of Rome, St. Clement of Alexandria, St. Cyril of Jerusalem. Many of them were bishops. Others were outstanding lay theologians. This is what we call tradition, because these early writers are witnesses to the apostolic preaching of the apostles themselves and the faith of the early church. This is their interpretation. As St. Paul says, he will be possessed by the devil. He will try to ape the true Christ, our Lord Jesus. This is why he is called the Antichrist. 
And just as God became incarnate in the humanity of Jesus Christ, so the devil will try to become incarnate in the Antichrist. Now, of course, he can't do it the way Christ did. A true incarnation requires divine, infinite power. But he will fully possess a human being. He will so take possession of this man as to completely control and dominate his life. He will be God's instrument for punishing a sinful and unbelieving world. Just as God used the pagan king Sennacherib to punish a sinful Israel, so although he is a man of sin, he will be permitted by God as a punishment for a sinful world. You know, the reason God will bring the world to an end is because, as we have seen, there will be so much sin and evil in the world that a just and merciful God could not allow the world to go on. He will have to bring it to an end simply to bring an end to the evil that will engulf mankind. The Antichrist will begin as a great political leader. He'll be a world statesman on an international level. He'll be a famous world leader. Perhaps someone like Lenin, you know, who came out of obscurity. During his early life, he will be hidden. He'll, he'll eat Christ. His early life will be a hidden life, just as Christ was in Nazareth. So his early life will be hidden. But then he will emerge on the world scene as a great political leader. Secretly, he will be most wicked. But outwardly, he will pass for the most virtuous of men. He will possess amazing intelligence and eloquence. A perfect example of this is Adolf Hitler. You know, in the 30s, many people hailed Adolf Hitler as the savior of Europe. I had an aunt on my mother's side. My mother's own mother came from Alsace Lorraine. You know, it's that disputed territory between Germany and France. And she had many relatives and kin back in the old country on both sides. I remember in the late 30s, around 1939, my mother sent me over one Thanksgiving. My aunt was living all alone. And I brought her a casserole of turkey dinner for Thanksgiving. And I visited with her for a while. And she was telling me about the letters she received from the old country and what a wonderful man Adolf Hitler was. And you know he had everybody fooled in the beginning. And the wonderful things that he was doing in Europe. He had done away with unemployment. Uh, the machinery of industry was grinding again. And people were going back to work. And, and, and remember, Europe suffered more from the Depression than America did. So at this time, Hitler was being hailed as a good man, a savior of Europe. Well, he was a forerunner of the Antichrist. He will be similar. He'll have everybody fooled. They'll think that he's the greatest thing since sliced bread. He will be fabulously rich. The Bible says he will control all the resources of the world. He'll control all the oil, he'll control all the gold, he'll control all the natural wealth of the world. And you know, the world is building up to this pinnacle. More and more, the wealth of the world is falling into fewer and fewer hands. One of our priests today at, uh, at breakfast, who's an economist, was just describing how many industries, you know, familiar industries like Kentucky Colonel Fried Chicken and, and Corvettes and now Howard Johnson's and many smaller industries are being bought up by European conglomerates so that the wealth of the world is falling more and more into the hands of fewer and fewer people. All the gold is in Geneva, Switzerland. 
You know, even the Russians keep their gold there. In the deep underground vaults in Geneva, Switzerland. So more and more it's becoming much easier for fewer and fewer people to get control of the world's wealth. He will cause the Great Depression. And as we know, that's very easy to do today. Just raise the prime rate. And the wheels of machinery, the machinery of industry comes to a grinding halt. During this depression with his vast wealth, he will buy up everything. He will have such complete economic control that no one can buy or sell anything without his leave. And this today is becoming much easier with computers. So that unless we have his special credit card, unless we have his special number stamped in our hands or on our foreheads, we won't even be able to buy or sell without his permission. Within three and a half years, he will become so powerful that he will be proclaimed the head of a one world government. You know, today, politics are building toward a one world government. Initially, the United Nations was supposed to be a one world government. You know, just recently in Europe, they formed the United States of Europe, the common market now, the economic ties between the states of Europe had become political ties. They elected their own parliament over there. So that what we have today is the United States of Europe, where ten nations there have formed a confederation like the original 13 colonies did here in America. And the Antichrist will have won such a following, will be so popular, that within three and a half years of his revelation, he will be elected, hailed, as the head of a one-world government. And you know, Hitler was elected too. He didn't take over by a coup. His Nazi party won the popular election. And as its head, he automatically became the chancellor of the Reich. So the Antichrist will be the head of a one-world government. And thank God, he will only have seven years in which to reign. Because they will be the seven worst years in the history of mankind. So our Lord said, never before in the history of mankind will there be such suffering as will exist during this seven-year reign of the Antichrist. Initially, he will bring great peace and prosperity to the world. Initially. He'll be hailed as the Savior of the world. St. Paul says this explicitly. But at the very moment when people are saying peace and prosperity, he'll bring an end to that depression which he started. In his one world government, having control of all armaments, he will bring an end to war. And people will begin to hail this as the golden age of mankind. Peace and prosperity will be on everyone's lips. It is then probable that he will have the Pope killed. You know, in the famous 12th chapter of the book of Revelation, you might want to start reading the book of Revelation, or as we used to call it, the Apocalypse, the last book of the Bible, in which St. John describes these latter days. You know, that famous 12th chapter of the woman clothed with the sun, standing on the moon with a crown of 12 stars on her head. You know, I think this was the message on October 13, 1917 at Fatima, when Mary gave us the miracle of the sun. I think she was symbolizing that this chapter of the book of Revelation was about to begin unless her requests were heeded. Well, of course, that woman told with the sun is the church. The crown of twelve stars are the apostles and their successors. In the same vision, John saw a dragon. The woman was with child. She was in labor, about to bring forth a child. When she is attacked by the dragon, who, of course, is the symbol for the devil. The tail of the devil, and of course, this being the serpent, the cunningness, the deceit of evil, will sweep a third of the stars from the sky. 
Now, stars are symbols of teachers. You know, in the book of Daniel, it says that those who instruct others unto justice will shine like stars in the kingdom of heaven. So these stars refer to bishops and priests. Those we have seen will fall into apostasy, in revolt against the church. The Antichrist will have the true pope killed. This seems to be the symbolism of the child that is born by the woman clothed with the sun. You know, the dragon wants to attack this child. He's just waiting for delivery. Finally, she brings forth a son destined to rule with an iron rod. Now, this is a symbol of Christ. The Old Testament foretells that Christ will rule with an iron rod. But of course, since this is taking place within the church on earth, it would apply more properly to the vicar of Christ, to the Holy Father. Somehow, some way, he will be done away with. And then these third of the stars that have fallen from heaven, the bishops and priests who have gone into apostasy, will then elect an antipope, a false pope. You know, this has happened several times in the history of the church, where various warring factions, uh, revolting, have set up their own pope, have elected their own bishop as pope. Well, the Antichrist, with uh, the help of these apostate bishops and priests, will elect their own pope. And the reason we will know he's the false pope one of the first things he will do is outlaw the Mass. This is clearly taught in several chapters in the Old Testament in the book of Daniel. He will do away with the Mass. The Mass will be outlawed, prohibited. He will then execute all priests. This is going up. At least all priests who continue to say Mass will be executed. Of course, this is going on today in Russia and China. Many priests that are caught openly are immediately exterminated in one way or another. Then he will proceed to exterminate all faithful Catholics. All those who remain faithful to Christ and the Mass and the Sacraments, these two will be systematically exterminated. But indeed, they will be the lucky ones. To die early during the reign of the Antichrist will be a blessing. The Antichrist will then deceive the Israelis into thinking he is the long-awaited Messiah. This is where he gets the title, the Antichrist. He will be proclaimed the King of Israel. He will work great miracles, as St. Paul said in the quotation I gave from Thessalonians. He will seem to work great miracles, great prodigies, with, of course, the help of Satan. And this will deceive many, many people. He will try to prove that Jesus Christ is an imposter. You know, it's interesting today, already several motion pictures have been made trying to prove that our Lord is an imposter. Just recently, uh, this one, I think it's called The Life of Brian, trying to intimate that Jesus Christ was nothing but an imposter. Also, Jesus Christ Superstar. You remember how popular that was? They're still singing the songs over the radio. That was a sinister play to begin with, a motion picture whose primary purpose was to portray Jesus Christ as an imposter. And this is where the Antichrist gets that title. He will so oppose Jesus Christ as to try to prove he is the imposter so that the Antichrist himself is the long-awaited Messiah. He will then rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. When our Lord describes the end of the world, the temple is clearly standing once again in the city of Jerusalem. And you know it could be built at any time. Since the Israelis took over 
the old city of Jerusalem, extensive excavations have been underway to, to expose once and for all those ancient foundations. You've probably heard of the Wailing Wall. That was part of the old temple foundations that have existed from the time of Herod. Well, all these now are being very carefully excavated. The temple precincts are being laid out so that it wouldn't take very long once the Antichrist decides to rebuild the temple. It could be rebuilt in just a few years. And this is when, as St. Paul says, when the temple is finished, possessed by the devil, he will become so arrogant that he will proclaim himself God. He will walk into the temple. This is the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet and reiterated by Jesus Christ. He will proclaim himself as God. This is when the Israelis, most of them, will realize the deception. This is when most Jews will be converted to our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, that's also predicted uh, in the New Testament by St. Paul, that in the latter days the Jews would be converted. Not all, but most of those who survived. And of course, because most Jews then will reject this false Messiah, finally uncovered, he will unleash a persecution against them, just as he un has unleashed a persecution against all Christians. By this time, the world will be engulfed in war. You know, to build a temple, they will have to destroy the Muslim mosque of Omar. The mosque of Omar was built by the Mohammedans over the foundations of the old Jewish temple. And this is one reason why it's so volatile in the Middle East. To build a temple, they'll have to destroy that mosque of Omar, which is second only to Mecca. You know, Mecca is the first shrine of the Muslim world. The next is the mosque of Omar. Muslims believe that it was here that Mohammed ascended into heaven. To, to build his temple, the Antichrist will have to destroy that mosque. And this will unleash a war that, of vengeance and terror, the like of which the world has ever known. This is when the four horsemen of the apocalypse will gallop throughout the world. A fierce and terrible religious war will break out that will lead to famine. Millions will starve, pestilence, insects, germs will swarm throughout the world, plague. This is when the four horsemen of the apocalypse will be unleashed upon the world. And by this time, hopefully, we'll all be dead. We'll all be martyrs in heaven if we live to see these end times. And I think by this time we'll be glad we're all dead. Because this will be a period of human history so horrible, so terrifying, that the world has never seen the light. As our Lord said in Matthew's Gospel, for then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the creation of the world until now, no and never will be. And unless those days have been shortened, no living creature would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. And immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels to gather his elect from the four corners of the earth. This will be the second coming of Jesus Christ. And by his second coming, as the apocalypse tells us, by the breath of his mouth, he will destroy the Antichrist and bring 
to our little old planet Earth, once and for all, the kingdom of God. The question is when? When will all this happen? Are we in the end times? The latter days predicted in many places by the Holy Bible, both the Old and the New Testaments. And you remember this was the very question. No sooner had our Lord prophesied the destruction of Jerusalem, his disciples came to him privately and they said, Tell us, Lord, when these things will come to pass. So they were curious and naturally we are curious. The answer, of course, has always been, we cannot be exactly sure. You recall when our Lord summed up his description of the end times. He said, but of that day and hour, no one knows. But of course you notice he says, that day and hour, the exact day and hour, the exact time. But certainly he gave us many signs, many signs that would forewarn us of the approach of that day and hour, that would lead up to it. And our Lord wanted us to be aware of these signs. He is quoted in the 21st chapter of Luke, verse 28, our Lord says, Now, when these things begin, to take place. He wants us to perceive the very beginning of these signs. And it's interesting to note too, the Bible says that because of the lack of faith, because evil will abound, most people will be totally unaware of the times in which they live. They will simply not realize they are in the latter days. But some will, our Lord said. Those who remain faithful. He says, when these things begin to take place, look up. Raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. The second coming of Christ is something we should look forward to. We should be anxious for its arrival. Because with the second coming of Christ will be the total and complete triumph of the reign of God on earth and the cessation of all evil. So we cannot know for sure, but at least we know we might be. We could be in the latter days. Ever since 1967, when the Israelis recaptured the holy city of Jerusalem, Prior to that, it was absolutely impossible because this prophecy had to be fulfilled. You know, during World War I, the carnage was so great, the shelling, the bombing, so widespread that many people thought then, this must be the apocalypse. This must be the end of the world. But it was impossible. But now that the Holy Land is once again the home of the Jewish people, now it could happen at any time. Why are we not certain? Why can't we be certain? Because people could repent. We're not fatalists. And as our Blessed Mother said, if people repent, God will grant to the world an era of peace. And men can always repent. And Our Lady promised, she said, when enough people heed my request, Russia will be converted and an era of peace will be granted to the world. So that although it seems to me we are well along the way into the latter times, all the signs but one have appeared, all of this could be brought to a halt if mankind returns to God. If mankind repents, then God will not bring the world to an end. And you know, Padre Pio prophesied that Russia will be converted when the number of Blue Army members 
equals the number of communists in the world today. When we can match the communists in numbers and fervor, Russia will be converted. The problem, of course, is that the number of the communists is growing every day. The Sandinistas in Nicaragua, they're Marxists. This brigade down in Cuba is to intimidate South America. First of all, to overrun Central America and finally all of South America. And this is one thing the communists have never tried to conceal. Their resolution to conquer the entire world. If you are not a member of the Blue Army, I would urge you to join. We've got to. We've got to equal the number of communists. But our Blessed Mother also warned at Fatima, if my requests are not granted, then Russia will spread her errors throughout the world, the whole world, provoking wars and persecutions of the Church. The good will be martyred, the Holy Father will have much to suffer, and whole nations will be destroyed. This is a beautiful description of the latter days. Our dear Blessed Mother has summed up in a capsule, in one sentence, what will be involved at the end of the world. Yes, our Blessed Mother promised that her Immaculate Heart would triumph, but this could be the Second Coming. You know, the Second Coming of Christ will be an answer to prayer. You notice the Bible ends. The very last words of the Bible are, Come, Lord Jesus, come. The early church that was so severely persecuted by the Roman Empire, they prayed for the coming of Jesus Christ. So that our prayers and devotions to the Immaculate Heart of Mary may usher in that era of peace when Jesus Christ will come a second time, slay with the breath of his mouth the Antichrist, and plunge all the forces of evil into the lowest pits of hell. What must we do? First of all, we must not be afraid. We hear of cases of self-styled prophets who predict the end of the world at a certain day and a certain hour. Periodically you hear of people who sell their farms and their businesses and they go and live on top of a mountain expecting the end of the world at any moment. Well, this is not something we should fear. Our Lord said, when these things begin to happen, lift up your heads and rejoice, for your redemption is close at hand. Let us consecrate ourselves to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. You know, the Bible indicates that during these terrible times of the latter days, God will exercise a special providence for his faithful souls, a faithful remnant who will cleave fast to Christ and to his Blessed Mother, that he will shield them in a very special and miraculous way from the terrible evils of the reign of the Antichrist. So let us consecrate ourselves to Mary's Immaculate Heart, rededicate ourselves to her. Let us practice her three-point peace plan. Remember she said, say the rosary every day for peace in the world. Offer up your sufferings to God in reparation for sin and the conversion of sinners. And perform your daily tasks patiently and well for the conversion of sinners and in reparation to Christ and the Immaculate Heart. I would recommend, do you remember that old prayer to St. Michael that we always said after Mass, St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle? You know, the book of Apocalypse says that in the latter days, Michael will be the great defender of the Church of God. What a beautiful way to express our devotion and to pray to St. Michael, say that little prayer. Also, too, as our Lord said, these days can be shortened for the sake of the elect. 
as terrible as they are, they can be shortened. And if we cannot delay them, at least we can shorten the end time by our prayers and by our sacrifices. And pray especially for the Church of Silence behind the Iron Curtain, behind the Bamboo Curtain. You know, for them, the end of the world has already begun. Certainly the Antichrist, the beast of the apocalypse, has been unleashed against our fellow Christians behind the iron and bamboo curtains. Pray for them that they will persevere. Pray for them that their trial and persecution will be short. I don't know of anything more that would please the Sacred Heart of Christ and the Immaculate Heart of Mary.